So I'd like you to write down a question if you're taking notes. And you can answer this question later, but I'd like you to ask yourself, do I have self-control? Of course, I don't mean me, I mean you. But do I have self-control? The average American seems to have a great deal of a lack of self-control. Uh, we live in an age of overconsumption. You know, McDonald's alone sells 75 hamburgers every second. So that equates to 30, or I'm sorry, 23 billion hamburgers a year. And I'm not a calculus major, but there's about 400 million uh, Americans here. And if you do the math, somebody's got a problem with hamburgers. So chances are there may be a few of us that have a slight problem with hamburger consumption. That's just McDonald's. Americans consume 58 million pounds of chocolate per year. And so that's about 12 pounds of chocolate per person. So potentially we have some chocolateholics in the audience, people who can't withhold themselves from chocolate. And also Americans consume 156 pounds of sugar on a per capita basis. And so that's 31 five pound bags per person. So no wonder why we have a diabetes problem. But somebody is bound to, in this audience, have a sweet tooth. And the list continues with more serious uh, subjects like alcohol consumption, uh, electronics, gambling, compulsive buying, pornography, drugs, language. And I, I recall I used to look, work at a uh, military repair and overhaul facility uh, where we overhauled turbine engines and, and all the employees there were ex-military and unfortunately sailors do cuss like sailors and uh, people do razz each other and, and you become uh, pressured by your peers and you feel as if you have to conform and you have to respond in the way all your peers respond. And so I can relate to the language piece. It, it, it is a trial to live in the world and 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 not be of it and to not exhibit the same uh, language and communication your peers do. But really, uh, you can name a lot of other things uh, that Americans and, and all of mankind really have a problem with, but whatever it is, you can overconsume, you can overindulge, and in, in that instance, you lose your self-control in the process. And the reality is that uh, the church has always been reflective of the society that they've been within. Uh, the, the Israelites is a good example of that. They came out of Egypt. Um, you know, they brought the idolatry. They brought the, the sin and, and the corruption uh, that was in Egypt with them. And it's very hard for God to teach them to put away the world. That was Egypt, what the Egyptian uh, society rep was representative of in the Bible literally and figuratively. But as God's people, we tend to struggle. We, we tend to struggle being in the world, but not of the world. It's a tough thing to do. Let's turn to Galatians 5, verse 19. Galatians 5, verse 19. And in uh, verse 19, it says, Now the works of the flesh are evident which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's a very detailed list there uh, that was provided. In verse uh, 22, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against there is no law. It's a little bit shorter list. God does tend to make things simple when you look at the fruits that can be uh, that can uh, come from God's Holy Spirit. So this initial set of scriptures here uh, discusses the works of the flesh. And these are the things that uh, we contend with and society can contends with, with on, a on a daily basis. And the second half of the scripture defines the fruits, the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And so you can note that one of the fruits is self-control. So I'll, I'll ask this question in a different way, because perhaps you feel you do have self-control. God's people strive for self-control. But how about this? Have you mastered self-control? 
And I think uh, today what we'll do is brief, briefly overview self-control and some points to develop our ability to work towards the mastery of self-control. And when we, when we think of self-control, often we think, yeah, I, I got self-control. You know, it's something that I, I, I try to exhibit. And, you know, I got my clothes on this morning and I got myself out of bed and I, I can in control of myself. Well, if that's true, if it's true that we have mastered self-control and living a righteous way of life, the fact of the matter is we wouldn't sin. If we truly have self-control, we wouldn't sin. But unfortunately, we all sin. We do sin, and we make mistakes, and we do what we know we shouldn't do. And for a time in those instances, that's when we lose our self-control. So what is self-control? looked into the dictionary base here, and the dictionary states that the self-control is the ability to control one's emotions, behaviors, and desires in the face of external demands. And those external demands would obviously be the society around us, all the influences around us, and it's tough, tough to do that. In psychology, it's sometimes called self-regulation. And so self-control or self-regulation is essential to uh, establishing and, and obtaining goals in your life or, or overcoming problems and, and things that uh, develop that could be hurtful to yourself or others. And clearly our goal as God's people is to control our emotions, our behaviors, and our desires. And this, my friends, is not easy. This is why we... Uh, go down a path of, of righteousness, uh, a path of life that is not easy. And, and the fact of the matter is, is, on our own, it's not possible. It's clearly not possible. If you look at society around today, most of society, 99.9% .9 of society, does not have God's Holy Spirit, and therefore it is not possible for them to master self-control. And the truth is that most and all of the individuals mentioned in the Bible struggled with the very battle that you and I are struggling with right now, within our hearts and minds and within all the life circumstances that uh, impede our ability to grow in living this righteous life. Let's turn to Romans 7, verse 8. Or Romans 7, verse 18, pardon. This is Paul speaking. In Romans 7, verse 18, it says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells, for, for to will is present with, it, with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. In verse 19, For the good that I will to do I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. In verse 20, Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. And so, you know, misery loves company, right? Paul here is saying, you know, look, I struggle. I struggle with this war within me where I do what I don't want to do. I know what I should do. I know what's right and I know what's wrong. I have God's Holy Spirit. I have the ability to, to discern good from evil and to apply that, but I don't. And this is the same struggle that you and I have with lacking self-control and overcoming our human nature. And this is true for every human being that's ever existed. Let's turn to 2 Peter 1, verse 5. As so we start to go down this path of exploring self-control from a biblical perspective. In 2 Peter 1, verse 5, it says, But also for this reason give all diligence Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brother, brotherly kindness, love. And that's agape love. That's the end result. If you truly master self-control, the end result would be love, which is what God is. In verse 8, for if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. 
And therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. And for so, an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So this gives us a, a sequence of events that have to occur for us to end up with this agape love. So your faith in God and his way of life and God's word will provide virtue. And if you, there's a lot of virtuous people out there. If you look at our founding fathers, they didn't have likely God's Holy Spirit, um, but they were virtuous. They did read God's word. They did study God's word and they tried to apply it to our nation and to themselves. And virtue means to be good and to have good moral value. And that comes from God's law and God's word. Nothing, nothing else provides that. And when you're faithful and moral, then God will provide knowledge. And so this is the knowledge of the truth which comes from God, God's word to instruct us. And with this knowledge now comes self-control. And self-control is purely an, a voluntary act. We have the free, freedom, free will in our lives. And so self-control is a voluntary act. And you can have, uh, be a faithful person. You can be a moral person. And you can be very knowledgeable. But without self-control, the knowledge and the faith are useless. You have to apply it in your life. So I'd like to highlight a point here that with the knowledge of God, God's truth, it's our responsibility to use this knowledge through self-control. There's an abundance of examples in the Bible where we could relate to trials and challenges uh, that confront our own ability to obtain self-control. First let's, off, let's review some examples of people in the Bible who lacked the ability to exhibit, exhibit self-control. There's actually a lot more people in the Bible who lacked the ability than had the ability, but Perhaps as we go through these examples, uh, we can internalize and put ourself, ourselves in, in the shoes of those whom we're speaking of and see if we could ask ourselves, ask ourselves if we have self-control in the face of temptation or perhaps great danger to our lives or the lives of others. The first example we'll review today is one of a good servant of God who clearly had to deal with his human nature, and that was Moses. And Moses lived... An amazing life. He was raised uh, by the Egyptian daughter of Pharaoh, and God blessed his circumstance. He actually ended up being taken care of by his Hebrew mother, who uh, nursed him since he, he was an infant. And although he may have been considered a son of the Egyptian family, it's quite possible that Moses was taught uh, by his mother. Uh, and, and so he was clearly taught Egyptian law. He was likely taught uh, Hebrew law and God's law and his way of life. But so as Moses grew and became a man, uh, that's where he started to make some mistakes. Now, in Exodus 2, verse 11, I'll just reference this for the sake of time, Moses kills an Egyptian. He sees an Egyptian uh, beating a Hebrew slave and uh, in a fit of rage, he looked both ways, clearly premeditatedly thought about it, and he, and he lashed out and he killed the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. And that's why he actually fled from Egypt at that point in his life. Another situation was uh, in Numbers 20, verse 8. And this is uh, where Moses was clearly instructed to speak to the rock, and this rock that would bring forth water for the Israelite nations. And he was clearly told to speak to this rock, and instead he hit the rock with his rod. And so Mel Moses fell in that scenario, just much like when he had killed the Egyptian, in a temptation of anger. And because of his laugh, lack of self-control, God punished him. He, uh, he told Moses that he wouldn't enter into the promised land, he wouldn't see it in his lifetime. And that's for a simple reason. God can't have his children or his leadership, especially setting bad examples um, for his family. And there's consequences. There's consequences to losing our self-control and allowing our human nature to overcome the wisdom God's given us. Let's look at a, another example. This is the last example concerning Moses in Exodus 32, verse 16. This is a very serious matter, but I've always viewed this situation as somewhat of a biblical blooper. Uh, it, it's uh, unreal what Moses did. 
but one can actually understand what he did and why he did it. Exodus 32, verse 16, and it says, Now the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. So this is serious stuff. These tablets were written by the hand of God. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people, as they shouted, he said to Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. In verse 18, but he said, It is not the noise of the shout of victory, nor the noise of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. And so it was, as soon as he came up near the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. And here's where the, Egyptian, or the uh, Israelites had put together the golden calf and uh, started having a party. And so Moses' anger became hot, and he cast the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. And so because of this great rebellion and this direct violation of God's law to, to not uh, worship false gods, he threw down and broke the very stones that God had given him, the tablets that uh, God's hand had written the law on. And one could appreciate the zeal Moses has here. Uh, he's mad for a good reason, but he didn't have self-control. He, he didn't practice self-control. He should have relied on God to punish and take care of the Israelites, but instead he uh, broke these tablets to show his frustration. Proverbs 14, verse 29. Solomon, of course, is the most, one of the most intelligent men who have ever existed. See what his wisdom says concerning self-control. There's several Proverbs that talk about it. And in Proverbs 14, verse 29, it says, he who is slow to wrath has great understanding, but he who is impulsive exacts, exalts folly. So people who do not think through, and they just do something. It's like uh, people who just buy a car on a whim. I think a, a vehicle purchase is one of the most um, impulsive buys in our market, and that's a big purchase, $30,000, $30, dollars $40,000. A lot of people go and to a vehicle uh, uh, dealer or furniture dealer, and they, they purchase a good that they hadn't planned. They should have probably paid cash for it. They should have planned for it. They should have thought about it. And there's a lot of people out there that don't think about it. Well, that's foolish. It's foolish to impulsively do things. And as God's people, we have to control our impulsivity. Proverbs 15, verse 18, just a few scriptures down here. It says, A wrathful man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger allays contention. It's so simple of a statement, but a very powerful statement. And there's, there's folks out there that are just looking for trouble. And if you're looking for trouble, you're going to find it. I don't know if you've ever seen that uh, movie, uh, Back to the Future. I, I can't, I didn't realize there's as much bad language in it as previous. I recently saw it. And there's this guy named Biff. And Biff's always looking for, for trouble. I don't know if you can relate to that, if you've seen that movie. But there, there's people out there in society who don't have anything better to do, I suppose. They, they have a heart uh, of hatred or, or what have you, and, and they feel that, that's their place in their life. But being slow to anger is not what you see in the world around us. You see war, you see uh, in the news uh, a lot of contention, and you can review the news every night and you can see examples of this road rage and uh, people being mistreated. Let's take a look at Saul. He's, he's an interesting case. Uh, one thing to recognize with a king of Israel is that they were anointed as a king. So a priest of the Lord would go, uh, the Lord God would anoint a king with oil, and through this anointing, uh, the king would obtain God's Holy Spirit. And, and that Holy Spirit would aid them in ruling their kingdom. And there is a secondary requirement uh, for king of Israel. And uh, according to Deuteronomy 17, verse 18, a king would be required to transcribe the entirety of the law. And so a king of Israel would have God's Holy Spirit, and he would have God's law. And so with those two things, he could adequately govern God's people. And as God's first fruits, uh, there's a lot of similarity. There's a lot of similarity between a king of Israel and us. When we're uh, baptized through baptism, we're given God's Holy Spirit. And before and after, 
uh, baptism as we uh, delve into uh, to the scriptures and the truth of God's way of life and his laws, we internalize God's way of life and his law. And then we use God's Holy Spirit and we use the knowledge that he gives us, his law, in our lives to rule over ourselves as a kingdom per se. God says our, our bodies are a temple that he gives us to dwell in and that's the kingdom that we rule as ourselves. And if we can't rule ourselves, how could we rule a kingdom? And it's an interesting concept to think about uh, in, in regards to a king of Israel versus us because we will be someday kings and priests. But we can find that Saul had a series of faults concerning self-control. And he was anointed king of Israel. He, was, uh, he had written the law. He understood God's law. Let's turn to 1 Samuel 18, verse 6. This is an example of a scenario that Saul got himself into. 1 Samuel 18, verse 6, it says, Now it happened as they were coming home that when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistines that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, with music, musical instruments. And verse 7, So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slayed his thousands and David his ten thousands. And then Saul was very angry and, and saying displeased him, and he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousand, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? And uh, generals of war, if you look back in history, pride themselves with how many people they've killed and how many battles they fought and how many wars they won. And so this is a great uh, defla deflation to Saul's um, to Saul's. Uh, uh, in his eyes, his reputation. In verse 9, So Saul eyed David from that day forward. And it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came from upon Saul, and he prophesied inside the house. And so David played music with his hand, and at other times, but there were, as at other times, but there was a spear in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. And now Saul was afraid of David, because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. And therefore Saul removed him from his presence and made him his captain over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And of course, David behaved wisely in all of his ways, and the Lord was with him. And at that time, uh, David had been anointed uh, with, with God's Holy Spirit by Saul. So because of Saul's behavior and his lack of self-control, God removed his Holy Spirit from him. And rather than Saul getting on his knees and asking for God's forgiveness, he began to rely on himself. And later, you can find in Scripture, he re relied on the satanic source. Uh, because uh, God, he didn't uh, go to God, he went to a satanic source uh, he went through the sorceress, thinking that the sorceress could uh, bring up Samuel, or Samuel, who had passed away through this median. And so clearly Saul chose the wrong path. He started going down this wrong path. And he, in this scenario, as I stated earlier, he clearly knew the knowledge of God. He knew God's law. He knew that he should be relying, reliant on God, but he, he didn't do that. He didn't have self-control. And he allowed a root of bitterness to overcome him to the point where he pursued an unrighteous path. And uh, you can find later that uh, Saul's lack of self-control actually led to his death. Proverbs 19, verse 11. Let's go back to Solomon's wise sayings here. Saul clearly had a problem with his anger and not relying on God. Proverbs 19, verse 11, it says, The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is, over, is to overlook a transgression. So we should be very slow to anger. That's pretty hard to do sometimes. I've met uh, folks in times past who seem to always be angry. I don't know if you've ever met anybody like that. It's hard to understand folks like that. But it's a glory to overlook a transgression. 
So in other words, you need to learn to choose your battles. Um, what, what are the uh, transgressions that are worth contending with or defending? And it seems a symptom of youth is to contend with every transgression. Uh, the older and wiser you become, the less uh, you allow things to get to you and uh, try to contend with. Uh, but the reality is, is we can't fix all the transgressions in our lives. There's going to be many transgressions. And it's important to have the ability to overlook transgressions. And if Saul would have overlooked this own, uh, this own uh, concern around David, he, perhaps he would have gone down another path. So there's, who set the best example in the good book? That'd be clearly Jesus Christ. Um, he set the ultimate example of self-control. Let's take a look at that in Matthew 26, verse 59. Matthew 26, verse 59. And it says, Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. And even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is this man, these men, what is it these men testify against you? And clearly this is not, it's a twisting of what Christ had said. He was talking about his resurrection, not about the temple of God. Verse 63, but Jesus kept silent and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under an oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the son of God. And Jesus said to him, it is as you said, nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and the coming clouds of heaven. In 60, verse 65, then the priest tore his clothes, and that's a sign of a, a great uh, sin taking place uh, with the priest tearing his clothes like that. He's saying he has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witness? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? And they answered and said, he is deserving of death. And if there's anyone who has ever on the face of this planet had a justifiable reason to reach out in anger against their accuser or defend what is being uh, proposed here in court, in this kangaroo court, if you will, it would have been Jesus Christ. And... Peter said that these are the examples that we should follow, the example of Jesus Christ. And this is a clear example of him practicing self-control. Matthew 27, verse 11, continues this example that Christ is setting. And this is Pontius Pilate that uh, Jesus Christ is standing before. He's a Roman governor. In verse 11, it says, Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. And then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? He knew that this is a false accusation. The, the, the governor knew that. Aren't you going to say something? Verse 14, but he answered him not one word, and so that the governor marveled greatly. And so the point here is that Jesus had to endure. Uh, he exhibited ultimate self-control. Jesus Christ could have called fire on heaven. He could have destroyed everybody in, in this uh, particular, uh, the, all these accusers and destroyers in, in, in this particular uh, instance. But Jesus Christ knew God's plan, and he maintained the self-control to follow through with it. And the self-control that Jesus set is a perfect example of what a human being with God's Holy Spirit is capable of. So today, we briefly looked at Moses and Saul and the lack of self-control that I think in one way or another we can relate to. Uh, we also looked at the ultimate example that Christ had set. And as we wrap this up, I'd like to leave you with three points in one scripture. And so the first point is that with the knowledge of God's truth, it is our responsibility to use this knowledge through self-control. 
With the knowledge of God's truth, it's our responsibility to use this knowledge through self-control. If you don't use it, you lose it. That's a fact. Second point. We need to recognize our weakness and lack of self-control. All of us have weaknesses. All of us lack self-control in one way or another. And it's up to us to identify that. If you can't identify it, then you can't work on it and, and try to get better at it. So the third point would be that we need to ask God through prayer to help us with our weakness to grow in strength and have the ability to overcome and practice self-control. Let's turn to James 1 verse 19 as a closing scripture. This particular scripture summarizes self-control. James 1 verse 19 says, so then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Doers, not hearers only. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive the meekness, the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Verse 22, but the doers of the word and not hearers only deceive yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. And if anyone among you thinks his religio he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted in the world. And being unspotted from the world can be translated keeping oneself in control or one who practices self-control. Being a doer of the word is practicing self-control. You can hear it, but if you don't do anything about it, then you aren't practicing self-control. So have we mastered self-control? The question will likely never be yes, but it is a question that we need to ask ourselves frequently.